Good morning. I'm John Horwich, the president and CEO of Easter Seals DC, Maryland, Virginia. Thank you so much for joining us today. At Easter Seals, our vision is to create a hopeful, inclusive community where all people realize their potential and live meaningful lives. Employment is a key aspect of that vision. And that's why we're so pleased to present this Workforce at Full Potential series in partnership with the Greater Washington Board of Trade and our knowledge partner, Accenture. Easter Seals appreciates these partners for helping us shine a light on how a diverse workforce and creating environments where all individuals can succeed enables companies and workers to prosper together. Expanding opportunities and enriching the daily lives of children and adults with disabilities and veterans and military families is central to the Easter Seals mission. And in today's session, you'll learn more about how employment of veterans and military family members will increase the power of your workforce. I also want to thank today's sponsor, Verizon, whose uh, support is helping make, it, make the session possible. Replays of our past sessions and signups for upcoming sessions are all available at Candid Conversations .org. We have a stellar panel for you today, so I want to pass it on quickly, but I'd be remiss if I didn't give a special thank you to Bob McDonald, who's been a wonderful mentor and supporter as we grow and enhance Easter Seal services. He's always generous with his expertise and wisdom, and I'm sure you'll appreciate his thoughts today. In a moment, you'll see a poll come up on your screen. Please participate, and while that's up, I'd also like to introduce today's moderator, Maggie Pollard. Maggie is a managing director in Accenture Federal Services. In addition to her work supporting the US government, Maggie is active in Accenture's corporate citizenship program, bringing her expertise to the nonprofit sector. So I'm excited to hear her questions for today's panel. Maggie? Sure, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited. Well, I think we might have lost Maggie. So while we're waiting for her to uh, come back in, I'd like to uh, ask the panelists to introduce themselves and maybe we can start with uh, Secretary Bob. Sure, John, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Bob McDonald. I graduated from West Point in 1975. I served primarily in the 82nd Airborne Division as an Airborne Infantry Ranger uh, Army Officer. Um, Left the military in 1980, joined the Procter & Gamble Company, spent 33 years there uh, all over the world, and uh, retired as the chairman, president, and CEO in 2013. In 2014, I was blessed. Uh, president Obama asked me to be the Secretary of Veterans Affairs and uh, did that for three years. Today, I'm the uh, chairman and an investor in, uh, in the largest uh, digital platform for veterans called Rally Point. Uh, I also uh, am the April and Jay Graham Fellow at the Bush Center. And uh, last night I was elected the chairman of the Association of Graduates of West Point. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but thank you very much, John. It's great to be here with these esteemed panelists. Uh, thank you for that, Bob, and uh, congratulations. Sounds like you've already had a busy week, uh, so thank you. So uh, next, we'll turn it over to uh, Robin Kelleher, who is the president and CEO of Hope for the Warriors. Robin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Maggie. Bob, that's hard to follow, but, but again, congratulations. Uh, it, what a great week for you and for all of us, actually, uh, to be able to participate on the panel with you. Um, as Maggie said, my name is Robin Kelleher. I'm the president, CEO, and co-founder of Hope for the Warriors. We are celebrating uh, 15 years of serving the military community. Most of our staff are military veterans or spouses, so we believe very strongly in employment um, and meaningful employment for military families. So it is a pleasure to participate with Easter Seals and the Board of Trade and the other esteemed members of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, next, uh, like David Muir, the Senior Vice President of Easter Seals Veteran Staffing Network. David, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Thanks very much, Maggie. 
Uh, and thank you everybody participating today. Um, I am a former infantry machine gunner in the Virginia Army National Guard. Um, was fortunate that I was not uh, in service during combat, but um, always had a deep love for being a soldier. Um, ultimately designed a uh, coaching curriculum for how to get a job and led the first redesign of the TAP program from the Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I happened across this amazing organization called Easter Seals that was really interested in um, veteran transition. Uh, and so uh, coming up on nine years ago, uh, we decided to get together and it's been my great honor to help develop a program and create partnerships with organizations like Rally Point um, to help change the lives and direction of an awful lot of our uh, service members and their families. So um, happy to be here. Thank you very much, David. And uh, our final panelist, uh, James Rodriguez, uh, US Department of Labor's Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy for the Veterans Employment and Training Service. James, would you, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, thank you, Maggie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, Maggie mentioned, I'm the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Department of Labor. I've been here since January 20th on day one of the administration. Uh, previously, 21 years on active duty in the United States Marine Corps, retired from there in 2009, uh, served as an executive in BAE Systems and Deloitte. Also in 2014 to 2017, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Office of War Care Policy. And then fortunately got the opportunity to serve again. And here I am, work with the phenomenal team at DOL Vets. Thank you, James. Uh, so I don't think that we could have a better lineup for uh, today's conversation. And so we'd love to dive back into it. Uh, so in terms of kickoff for questions, and as we dive into the topic of the value of veterans in the workforce, uh, one of the things that struck me is I think intrinsically, we all know that meaning and purpose are important to veterans. Uh, veterans typically have a strong yeah, intrinsic need to find meaning and purpose in their work, and it's what attracted them to military service in the first place. And so what are we as a society doing currently to better pull veterans into our communities to give them that sense of inclusivity and purposefulness? And so uh, with that, I would love to start with you, Robin, uh, just recognizing the wide breadth of support that Hope for the Warriors provides to communities. If you want to take a swing at that. Yes, absolutely. And thank you. Um, <clears throat> the focus on veteran employment and military spouse employment as is as important um, is paramount now. And it is the conversations are daily. And I think that's important. Um, it's a priority um, in most companies. It's a priority in this country. It's a priority in communities as it should be. Um, now we need to come together and come up with, with the solutions, right? The conversations are great, but solutions are what need to follow. Um, as you mentioned, the meaningful employment is critical uh, to, for careers and that future careers. I think what we at HOPE are doing, um, we have two places here, is we work to stabilize the veteran and the military family so that meaningful employment can happen. And that's an important place, that transition place between leaving the military and going on to your next journey. There is a lot of steps in between, and there's a lot of things that we need to address uh, in between those stages to really stabilize, again, that family member, um, the veteran or the spouse. The other piece is also preparing companies for veteran hiring. And many are great at knowing what, uh, you know, what veterans need and what they, um, what, what they can contribute, but many are still just trying to figure that out. And so working with the HR department and leadership in different companies and sharing the culture of the military and what meaningful things they can do to enhance um, the opportunities in their own companies is really one, another place that we can all be better at. But I think it takes a company to be humble enough to ask the question, you know, what can we do? to make sure that we're attracting and retaining good veteran staff. Thank you, Rob, uh, Robin. Uh, hey, I think, I think your question um, uh, had implicit in it a really important insight that I wanted to underscore, which is, uh, it was my belief as Secretary of Department of Veteran Affairs, I couldn't solve every problem with a 2,000 mile screwdriver from Washington, DC. 
that we had to build strength in communities so communities could customize the offerings of the federal government and uh, to make them fit their communities. So we created something called community veteran engagement boards where we actually asked communities to come together. We would have the leaders of the VA on those boards, leaders of the hospital, leaders of benefits, leaders of memorial services or the cemeteries, but we would ask the community to lead that board and make sure that they were customizing what VA was giving uh, from afar. It was my dream. Um, I don't, and, and yeah, the secretaries that followed me are pursuing this. It was my dream that when a veteran moved from Chicago to Orlando, for example, that they're I can uh, contribute if, uh, if we've lost Bob's feed um, and pick back on what Robin was sharing, right? That um, these organizations that want to hire veterans, I think um, people have heard that hiring veterans are valuable. Um, you know, the Institute of Military and Veteran Families up at Syracuse really launched that thought leadership and proved that. Um, I think the big question now for employers is, okay, we want to do it, but we don't know what we don't know, right? And so the engagement to make them feel um, better about the community is to establish with the community. Go out to the career one stops and meet the veteran reps that are in your neighborhood that are interacting with the veterans and military families that are looking for work in your community. Um, attend thought leadership. And there's a lot of thought leadership. We work with uh, organizations all the time. And if you want to create retention, have community activities that your company does that reach out to other veteran organizations and have a joint opportunity. And these are just a few small ways that companies can really begin to foster that sense of community for veterans and their families. David, I really like that point uh, because I think oftentimes uh, employers or, or, or communities think that they need to build it from scratch, if you will, right? That they need to come up with their own solution for it. And so I, I really love uh, both your example and, uh, and Bob's example around how do you take those existing assets in your community and bring them together uh, to make it easier for, you know, the sum, of the, the sum of the parts, right? Bring everything together and be able to capitalize on that versus creating it as a pocket within your own organization. So, uh, so thank you for building that out. Uh, so if we move on a little bit, so we, we understand how do we create that structure for, uh, for veterans to find that meaning and purpose. Uh, and we know that there are lots of pockets of good across the country. I, I know that uh, there are a number of programs and initiatives out there that we're seeing with great success. Uh, for veteran employment opportunities. And so, uh, so I would love to, uh, for, for um, James, for you to kind of build on some of the programs and initiatives that you're seeing over in DOL Vets that are really yielding those results that employers can take heed of as they're thinking through their own programs and plans. Oh, thank you, Maggie. That's actually a great question. I just had a great conversation in Atlanta with an employer down there that was actually looking uh, how to bring more vets into their organization. And they had a, a national wide, a nationwide footprint. One of the things that they were doing is looking beyond just the MOS and the skill sets that they had in the military, but looking at the capabilities that they could bring to an organization and really kind of reimagining how they could use veterans into the workplace. And they were looking at uh, specific things that the service member had such as operational experience. It might not be an operations MOS that they were in, but they had operational experience, program management type experience, things that uh, traditionally a veteran may not put in their resume, right? And so they were actually figuring out what type of skill sets that someone in the military had at specific ranks with specific type of uh, knowledge that they developed in training 
And then they figure out where they can put them and place them into their company. And they found out that uh, it was they were actually widely successful because bringing someone in basically with an artillery background into an operations type role allowed them to be successful because they had that operational mindset. And so uh, that was one example. But what they were doing is kind of reimagining you know, where they can plug and play, right? And uh, as well as figure out what type of training that individual would need once they actually did enter to that industry. So it wasn't just put them into the industry. It was really, how do we continue to give them professional development so they can have long-term success? And I think that's what industries really need to understand is, is the individual service member has to understand how this is a career that can have upward mobility, right? And that trajectory, regardless of where they enter that uh, workplace, but also the type of training and development they're accustomed to, similar to the military, that's going to help them get there. So they need to have that site picture, if you will, and uh, to the point that you've been using is purpose, right? They understand how their purpose is uh, going to be fulfilled within that specific industry. So those are some of the things that uh, we know companies are doing. Not all of them are doing it to the capacity because they don't have all the resources, uh, specifically the small businesses. And so a lot of the small businesses do not have the resources like the larger companies do. But I think somebody mentioned that mentoring piece, right? It's connecting the dots with those large organizations, those small organizations is critical. I did this when I was at BAE Systems to our suppliers, and that actually worked out well. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities for growth in those relationships within every, uh, every specific industry that we want to highlight. There's numerous opportunities for growth there. One of them being uh, clean energy. As we know, the president and uh, is going to be focused on clean energy. So we are working with the Department of Labor internally with our um, uh, employment training and administration colleagues to really figure out how we can get more service members into apprenticeships for clean energy, but also to employment in clean energy. And then my goal is to even hopefully be entrepreneurs in clean energy. So we're looking at kind of succession uh, types of uh, opportunities to be successful when they do transition out. Uh, th that's fantastic, uh, James. And th those are great examples, right? Taking um, uh, forthcoming legislation, understanding industry trends, and how are we uh, best preparing the transitioning workforce yeah. to respond to those trends? I think that's fantastic. Um, David, anything from the Veteran Partner Network that you're seeing in terms of success you want to expand on? Yeah, so, um, and, and James hit it out of the park with apprenticeships, right? It really is um, a new labor market. Um, and employers, if they really look, especially if they're established, you know, they have someone who's coming in for this kind of a training program for this long before they're up to speed and functional in their role. Well, that's really the framework for an apprentice program. And every state has an apprenticeship board. And so if you've got, as an employer, a systematic way that you onboard a candidate, that is something that could possibly turn into an apprenticeship and then be made widely available to service members who are transitioning out. Um, other things, um, employers, you know, they, they think they know what they want, but they don't know how to reverse engineer that into military job descriptions. They don't know. And I encourage all businesses that I'm working with to use an amazing tool that is the Department of Labor's ONET online. And so many people don't know anything about it. And it really is a way for an employer to go in, identify skills that they want in a particular person, or let's say I meet someone and that person is, um, I don't know, a Yankee whiskey tango, whatever their particular code is, right? Um, they can actually go into ONET online through their military crosswalk and see a comp comprehensive job description. So I'll drop the, uh, the link here in the chat box for everybody. Uh, really, really great tool and great answer, James. Thank you. I'd like to uh, give a, assuming my internet holds up, I'd like to also give an example that I remember from Chicago when I was secretary where uh, Mayor Emanuel, uh, Rahm Emanuel, got together with the gas union and the community college system, which of course he uh, owned as mayor, uh, and any veteran coming back uh, could get free community college training in the gas industry, automatic union membership in the gas union, and an automatic job, double the minimum wage working for the gas industry. Um, and I don't know about you, but if, if, if I've got somebody working on the gas lines in my house, I'd rather have a veteran who has that attention to detail 
that uh, that nothing would go wrong. But again, it's an opportunity for the community to identify a need and come together to solve that need by employing veterans. Uh, that's a great example, and, and I would uh, certainly agree with you, Bob, in terms of uh, who I would want to invite in to uh, toggle with the gas lines at my house. Uh, so I remember uh, my own uh, transition while it was about 12 years or so ago. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was so anxious in terms of uh, what my next opportunity was going to look like, how I would transition into the civilian workforce effectively. And so uh, I, I know you all are experts in this field and, and mentoring uh, every day. Uh, I'd love to understand from what you're seeing, what are the typical barriers that you're seeing that veterans are facing in that transition to, to finding employment or, or uh, better said, finding the right employment and, and what can we be doing to assist? And so Robin would love uh, for, for some of your perspective in, in all of the mentorship that Hope for the Warriors is providing to kick us off. Um, so our, from our perspective and the work that we do, a lot of the barriers we see are very fundamental needs, transportation, st again, stability in the family, um, food insecurity, the things that really, um, and that's, a, again, what we address at our level in order to ensure that we can, um, you know, take that next step to finding meaningful employment. Um, so those are the things to me that you really have to think about too, where where are these veterans in their life journey? And are they in a stable position to be able to take advantage of? There's so many amazing opportunities out there, but we've got to make sure that that journey is at a place that they're able to take care of, you know, take advantage of those opportunities. So for us, it is very much about the fundamental needs. And then we just step them through that journey to, um, to be able, again, to um, access the, the different resources that are in their communities. But it's also about awareness, right? Like everyone has shared some amazing things that people are doing. We need to know about them. And people, uh, organizations that are working with veterans and military families need to know what those resources are. Because you know we're in a place of, of creating a network of care. Uh, we're obviously a force multiplier if we're all working together. So awareness of the resources, if there's you know a better way that we can start a, um, really coming together and talking about the resources that we all have and the opportunities that we have and how do we work together to ensure that journey is successful. Go ahead, James. Yeah, I was going to add to that. Magazine's 100%, uh, Robin's 100% correct as always, right? Is that, uh, you know, it's really the community of partnerships, I think is an important piece. But it starts while the service member makes that decision when they're going to separate or retire, transition out of the military, is trying to get as much information as they possibly can. And we also, from a government standpoint, provide as much resources as we can to make them, uh, well, get them better prepared to make an informed decision. That's really one of the challenges, first of all, right? But we know that uh, getting people in the skill bridge also leads to success because while they're in, on skill, in skill bridge, that you know, they develop some skills and they find out if that's the right industry they want to get into and they're making those partnerships and they develop that network. Oftentimes our veterans get out or become, our service members get out as when they become veterans and they're underemployed because they do not understand the industry that they're getting into. They may have a snapshot of it, but they may not really understand that industry and realize that it's not for them. And then they go on, on, on to unemployment and then they're trying to find, again, where's that purpose? Where's that right type of job for their long-term career? One of the things we're doing at the Department of Labor, we launched a pilot called the Employment Navigator Partnership Pilot at 13 installations around the country. The 75th Regiment, Regiment is actually our uh, supported organization that we're working closely with. And we're doing exactly what Robin mentioned. We're working with um, specific partners in specific industries and uh, nonprofits to really make that connection for that service member who may not be prepared when they're transitioning out. So we can do that one-on-one -on -one tr um, transfer of information to the, to the um, from the individual to the partners. And then we can help with that smooth handoff that uh, is often talked about, right? So we're ensuring that they get a lot of that information up front. Case in point, uh, you know, having information about what type of taxes you're gonna pay when you do separate from the military, because oftentimes we forget about that when we're on active duty, as you all know, right? Uh, understanding what type of healthcare you're gonna have when you transition out for you and the family, you know, are you gonna lose healthcare? things like that. So we want to get them a lot of that information, but we also want to get them to partners like Robin or other corporate partners who we are um, piloting the 
who we are part of our pilot rather. And so they understand again, that there is someone that they can literally make a handoff to that's gonna help them uh, find employment and hopefully find long-term success. Yeah, great answer. And Maggie, if I could jump in here for a second. Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, James um, just kind of uh, mentioned something um, that is not really known except to service members, right? And that's called the SkillBridge program. Um, and for those who don't know what the SkillBridge program, and I'm speaking specifically to employers, right? Um, they also are curious a lot of times about how I'm going to get a veteran in, how is that person going to fit with our workforce? They have the same questions. And SkillBridge is a partnership between um, OSD, Department of Labor, Department of Defense, started several years ago. And what it allows is, so if, uh, if I'm a service member who is deemed not necessary, right? Meaning I'm at the tail end of my tenure in uniform. Um, I, and I can I have a list of employers who are an approved skill bridge employer. Uh, there's an application process that a, a company needs to go through to become an approved partner. But that creates a, a in, in a sense, an internship opportunity. So that transitioning service member can then go work in a role at ABC company, uh, they will be collecting their salary from the Department of Defense. And at the end of the internship, um, I just have to be guaranteed for an interview uh, on the other side. There's got to be a real job there. And it is an amazing way for companies and veterans to connect um, in, in almost a no risk environment. So SkillBridge, DOD SkillBridge, really recommend as an employer, you should go and check it out, see if you qualify to be improved. That, that's a, a great call out. Uh, I know Accenture participates in SkillBridge. We've uh, had fantastic uh, team members that we've been able to uh, participate in the program and then bring on as employees. So uh, can speak from experience. I, I do love um, uh, both uh, uh, Robin and James, what you were talking about is I think we often contextualize, you know, um, just getting the veteran the job, right? Let's just get them into the job. But really, it is the, the whole person piece, right? How are we making sure that they have the right structure in place so that they can have the daycare, have the transportation? Are they in the right location for that role? And so I really appreciate, Robin, how you contextualize that to essentially take a step back before you talk about, well, what job are we going to get for you? How do we make sure that you're going to be able to be uh, successful in, in that role and be able to retain you in that role because you have the right uh, structure in place? Yeah, Maggie, my, my advice to, uh, to veterans is um, don't take a job, uh, pick a career. Uh, that, you know, don't lose self-confidence in all of the traits and experience that you've picked up in the military. Don't necessarily pick a title, don't necessarily pick an income, uh, but, but find a career, something where you can satisfy your purpose. Uh, in my particular case, and I know it was many years ago, I started at the bottom of the organization. Um, and oftentimes I know, uh, particularly those people who have lots of responsibility in the military, they get frustrated with the fact that they're not given uh, commensurate responsibility in the private sector immediately. Um, Obviously, it takes time to learn a business, and uh, and don't be frustrated by that. Uh, pick the right career, and uh, and have at it, and have confidence in what you've learned and the experiences you've had. Yeah, That's can I add something to Secretary McDonald? One hundred percent, right? And you know, my limited experience, I just had this conversation with a corporate, uh, an organization uh, last week, actually talking about uh, what can they do better to bring more veterans into the workplace. And I think it was mentioned originally, it's, it's also incumbent upon the organizations to do their own internal training, right? To understand the value that veterans, veterans bring into the workplace. Uh, as I mentioned in my limited experience, what I've learned is that veterans often leave people and veterans alike, often leave managers. They don't leave organizations, right? Because of oftentimes that manager does not understand how they can utilize that veteran skill sets. They may bring them in for a specific job, but that veteran wants to get involved in more things, right? And getting them to understand where their value is. Also, how they can support them. If a veteran has um, VA appointments, for example, that they can't change, it's impossible to change. You know, how do we really understand how to give them the right time off without having to use all of their vacation? I mean, those type of things where they have to really be uh, imaginative on how they can support that veteran's long-term success in that career. And I think uh, 
but as I speak to corporations, you know, I always tell them, you know, you've got to look beyond what your traditional employment uh, mindset is when you work with veterans, because oftentimes there's unique needs that those veterans uh, need support with. And we have to, this goes back into training. So we had um, one of our directors speak at the Society of GP Resource Managers out in Las Vegas at a national conference. So really talk again about the value of veterans and how corporations can do better at educating their managers, their HR professionals on how to work with veterans. And so I think there's a lot of work still to be done in that space. Uh, and I can uh, tell you from my corporate experience that, you know, there is work to be done and, and we've got to figure out how to best inform uh, those corporations about the value of veterans and that they can build up with internally to their corporations to make those veterans successful. I absolutely agree. And James and, and sir, you made such a good point. Um, about the job versus a career. And I think it's really incumbent on both the veteran and the company to do due diligence in terms of what is the mission of the company? Is it well communicated to the veteran? Because that's what we know is their culture is so critical to them is a mission that they can wrap themselves around. So as a company, you wanna really be able to communicate that mission well and really encourage someone to say, I, I, you know, I'm in, I can do this. And, and on the veteran side, like you said, sir, the, uh, you want to be in an environment that's meaningful and purposeful. So understanding the mission of the company that you're applying to, or the culture of the environment in that company, is that where, is that going to feed your soul, right? And that's where we're going to retain veterans in the workplace. So it really is incumbent on both sides to make sure you're doing due diligence of, of where you wanna work and where you wanna be, what's important, but also that company to ensure that they're communicating that mission well. Most uh, large companies today, um, even medium-sized companies have shared interest groups of veterans. I know mm -hmm. the Procter & Gamble company, the company I led has a very large shared interest group of veterans. And those people get involved in the recruiting, the onboarding, the training, um, of veterans. And I think as a result, uh, that shows their interest uh, in recruiting veterans and, and, and making sure they develop um, those employees. It gets back to the, the research that Got Your Six did many years ago, which, which showed that you know veterans vote more often, veterans are on school boards more often, veterans are leaders more often. I mean, it's in the interest of every uh, business in the world to want to have veterans uh, in their organization because they are the future leaders of that organization. And uh, as I say, many companies have uh, shared interest groups that help lead that. Yes, we work very closely with the ERGs at most of our corporate partnerships and, um, and they are, most of them are extremely active. Um, they're, they're well informing. Uh, I think the HR, you know, people depend on uh, the guidance and the information that they can share, but also that mentorship. That's where you build that mentorship in, in your company is bringing, because that's, that's what our veterans are used to, right? They've been mentored along their journey in the military from day one. So again, replicating that kind of a culture in your organization is another great tool uh, to retaining and attracting. Th these are all good points. Oh, go ahead, Dave. I was just going to say, a lot of times um, organizations don't know what to do, right? Mm -hmm. And even little simple things, particularly when it comes to retention, are important. And it all starts with what is your veteran population currently? How many people from the military community have? And that's uh, done with a population survey. And I've talked to a lot of HR people who conduct them. And they say, we don't have a great response rate. And the reason is there's no reason for me to raise my hand and say I'm a veteran other than for you to have a number, right? For your affirmative action plan. And so the thing that we recommend is to create a mentorship program. And what this means is that let's say Bob is uh, joining the company, right? And James has been with us for eight years. And James is invited to be a mentor for the first 90 days to a veteran new hire, right? Well, there's a real good likelihood that James as an employee is gonna raise his hand to volunteer to be a mentor. Because even though James is Marines and Bob is Army, on this side of the fence, we're all one, right? And so just that unique combination creates 
um, a familiarity. It gives me an acclimation opportunity to the organization. I can see other veterans doing a veteran spotlight that goes out to your, you know, employees in the community newsletter, the company newsletter once a month. Hilton did an amazing thing for retention. So subtle. If you go to the Hilton, if you see a veteran, look on their name badge and the insignia of their branch of service is right there next to their name. Wonderful. I've had other companies that put the insignia on the on the cards that we used to scan into doors. Those little tiny things create that sense of well-being, of, of desire, and that makes me want to stick around more. And once you get that kind of traction, I'm bringing all my veteran friends. The word gets out, and then you don't have a problem hiring veterans. You know, David, I love those examples um, because it is the small things that can then grow to bigger things. It's, it's not so, it, it's not a, a huge hurdle that companies have to overcome. Um, we guided one of our partners, uh, it, it, same thing, they were having trouble identifying the veterans on their staff. And so we recommended that they celebrate the birthdays of all the branches. And boy, did they figure out who their veterans were. And it was, it was just a very simple thing. And not only did they identify those veterans, but they made them feel important and special and celebrated. So it, it can be little things that companies can do to really, as you said, attract and retain, and then let's bring them on. <laughs> yeah, now I'll add something real quick to that, if you don't mind, is that uh, that's specifically important for women veterans, right? Often mm -hmm. when you know, we think about veterans corporate wise, you know, they're talking, they put the information out, they're trying to gather information, but a lot of times women veterans don't self-identify as veterans. And so it becomes a challenge. And so we want to make sure that we, you know, we actually put the effort into identifying our women veterans so they feel like they're part of the team also. Absolutely. And another community that is, is actually one of the silver linings with the portability of work that employers have now discovered as a result of the pandemic is there is a huge audience of military spouses out there who yeah. face real challenges getting employed because they're getting, they're going somewhere else in two to four years. And employers don't want to take that risk, even though the average tenure for an employee is like less than three years in America right now, let's be honest. But now that I realize that this role in my organization can be portable, I now don't have to let that military spouse go when he or she has to move halfway around the world, right? If that job can be portable, mm -hmm that can create tenure. And again, these are little tiny things. Does your website, you have an abccompany.com slash veterans? Does it say anywhere on your website, we love veterans and we want you? Those are little tiny things that all add up. Yeah, absolutely. I love the military spouse reference. And we have about 70% of our staff are military spouses. And you know they, they're working from every, every part of the world. Uh, we make adjustments in terms of timing and it works and we keep we keep them uh it's that's the military spouse piece is so important and again we're looking at where where are we also supporting them in terms of an education in order to be able to be employable and again working with hr companies to understand their resumes and make sure that they are recognizing the challenges the child care challenges the deployment challenges that may arise uh, that education process really does need to include the military spouse employment. That's a great point. And if you uh, are not familiar with the military spouse employment partnership, which is operated out of the um, OSD, mm -hmm. uh, it is a community of organizations that are committed to hiring veterans. They're an excellent way to plug into the military spouse um, world. You also might want to check out hiring our, our heroes military spouse program. Um, two very connected organizations in the military spouse community, if that's something that you want to do with your business. David, with all the uh, hot tips and suggestions, <laughs> uh, drop the, those links in. Uh, so I, I think we touched on an interesting topic, and, and I know that it's in the forefront of the news, right? The Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, most news articles that we're reading, they're all talking about this great resignation. We know that the veteran population is a subset of that, right? So let's say that, uh, Bob, a veteran took your advice, you know, they, they joined a company for the career, they, they joined it because they saw future potential. How, how do we set them up for success where they want to stay at that organization? They want to see themselves as a CEO one day. How can we do that? 
Well, first of all, I would hope they had aspired to much more than being the CEO. Uh, and I, I say that uh, uh, part uh, jocularly, but part uh, in seriousness. Usually, if you want to be the CEO, you're not going to become the CEO. Uh, you have to you have to want something uh, more purposeful than that title. But uh, my, my, my thought goes back to what uh, James and Robin and David were talking about earlier, which is the importance of training and development. I really believe more and more young people today are looking for opportunities to join uh, firms where they can be trained, where they can be developed, where they can learn skills that they can take with them, uh, where they can be mentored. Um, that's, you know, somebody said earlier, I think James said it earlier that People leave uh, bosses, they don't leave companies. And, uh, and it's the companies that are training to, and developing people and making sure they're always challenged that, uh, that companies like to stay with. I, I can tell you that at least each time I was promoted at the Procter & Gamble company, I always felt it was too early, I wasn't ready. Uh, and it was those challenges, uh, whether they be in the Philippines or in Japan or, or wherever that, uh, that kept me going. I, I just think that there's so much to do there and so much potential that veterans have that companies have to keep them challenged and have to keep giving them the training and development that they need to succeed. Yeah, no, I, had to, I think 100% I agree with Secretary McDonald. I think veterans like the challenge, right? Military spouses like the challenge. You know, uh, I think that's really one of the, the uh, unique skills I think that we have, and I'd say it's a skill, right, is that we really enjoy the challenges, right? We want to have, you know, responsibility. We want to figure out where are the complex problems that we can help figure out, we can help solve. We like that because that's what we were trained on in the military, right? Solving complex challenges and figuring out how to be successful. Uh, we jokingly said, you know, when we went into this pandemic and the government put us on lockdown, we were used to that type of stuff because the government has a way of changing our plans. Oh. Yeah, how to adjust while we're on active duty. And so I think that's kind of the same concept is, is looking at where we can really, um, one, inform them of the opportunities that exist as they develop their career path, but also informing them of the type of training they need to get into specific uh, seniority roles, right? And so it's not just you continuously get promoted off your merit, because that's one of the things, but there's also professional development that helps you be successful when you get into those more senior roles. And we have to get them to understand. And I always you know, refer back to the military. As you get promoted in rank, you're also getting additional training. So it's the exact same type of thing that veterans are looking for when they get into the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. I love that You know, we keep referring back to the actual culture of the military and what um, you know, you may not have a military culture within your organization, but you can certainly capitalize on the essence of the military culture and, and that idea of, you know, we, we look at just moving around every two to three years. So why not move up every two to, right? Just continuously kind of moving and growing and advancing um, and really capitalize on that piece of the military culture within your company. Um, Maggie, I see a question on Guard and Reserve that somebody had asked. If uh, if it's okay, I'd like to touch on that. Please do, Dave. Okay. Um, I don't know if everybody can see the question, but but they're asking about how to attract um, Guard and Reservists uh, to get them to build awareness. Um, you can reach out to the Army P three office, the Army Reserve P three office, the public private partnership. Um, in there, they have employment counselors, and all you need to do is connect with their particular regional representative, and they can start putting you in touch with the um, reservists who are in that area. And then with regard to National Guardsmen, um, you can reach out to the National Guard Bureau in your specific state, and they have a primary person in there that's responsible for employment, and they can help you navigate to get the word out to the armories throughout the National Guard. Um, and there are other events called yellow ribbon events that you can take a look at, which is a lot of times um, when a demobilization happens and a unit comes back from a deployment, there's an awful lot of people who are going to be out of work. And it's a great way to connect and, and meet and broadcast your interest in hiring garden reservists. So I just wanted to get actionable, actionable things out to, to people. Yeah, David, those are such great resources too. And then we go, go back to the education within that company as well, you have to understand what the, you know, what the expectations are on those, those people serving in the Garden Reserve and their families. 
So it's, um, it's a different lifestyle and one that we know that the suicide rate in the garden reserve is actually much higher than it is in the rest of the branches. And there's reason for that. So if that is, a, you know, that if you're trying to attract that kind of talent, which is wonderful, you need to be able to support that talent as well. Yeah, I, I think building on that, Robin, um, you know, creating that awareness for hiring managers and HR when they're having those interview conversations, I, I, uh, from experience, right, uh, uh, perhaps garden reservists could be nervous around, hey, I'm going to need to take this amount of time off and making sure that those individuals are on the uh, employee side are equipped with the right information to say, Absolutely. Here's the program that we have in place. No problem at all. This is something that our organization supports so to put them at ease and kind of know that that's welcome and accepted within the organization. Yeah, that's one of the things we do here at DOL Vets is we actually are state directors and some of our regional veteran employment coordinators around the country. We speak to guard units to David's point when they return, right? We talk to them about employment opportunities, businesses that we have relationships with from that state and local level. But we also speak to, to industries and we get them to understand the importance of USERA and how to abide by USERA. So the United States Employment Reemployment Rights Act. So they understand how to deal with guard reserve when um, they're mobilized. So we, we try to be proactive in our educations because it works to the benefit of the Guard Reserve member, but also works to the benefit of corporations. So they understand you know, how the best to the point that was made here, how to best support those Guard and Reservists. Well, hiring Guard and Reservists is, is certainly the right thing to do. Um, I would also argue that, that you're benefiting your corporation because you're adding people who are experienced leaders, number one, and number two, you're adding people with diverse experiences, which are going to improve your innovation, your rate of innovation. We always found that as we, as we put together groups of diverse people or people with diverse experiences, uh, we always got better innovation. And innovation is the way that you improve the way uh, you improve lives if you're working in a, in a commercial company. So I, I, I think there are lots of good reasons uh, to employ guards, reservists, people with military experience. Uh, as we've been talking about this morning. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Uh, I want to go, I know we took a poll at the outset of uh, this conversation. Are we able to flash up those results and then would love to turn it over to open Q&A from our attendees. Do we have those poll results up? All right, we can come back to those. Uh, I wanna go back to um, a previous audience question and then open it up to the floor. So uh, specific around expertise and industry. So the question is, uh, are there physician or advanced practice provider uh, veterans who are also looking for employment as they transition? If so, how could a uh, prospective employer be able to reach out to that regarding employment? So I'll open that up to the floor, uh, David or, or James, that's something you want to take. Well, you know, people with that level of skill yeah. don't really have a problem finding a job when they transition out, right? Because those skill sets are really um, coveted. There's a vacuum for advanced level skills like that. Um, so broadcasting yourself uh, and your company's reputation in that community, uh, maybe networking with the local base to let people know um, at their transition office um, that you're interested in talking to those people um, is a way to get in front of them a little bit, but there's no pipeline that you can turn the water on and, and you're gonna have doctors falling into your lap. It's just not a, it's not real. If I was yeah. looking for advanced practice uh, providers, I would think also about hiring uh, people with medic experience in the military. Uh, one of the things that uh, veterans who have been medics suffer from is there's no national certification. Uh, normally it's state by state. And one of the things you could do if you wanted to advance practice nurses, for example, is hire people who were medics, help them use their GI Bill to get to the APN level. And then as you help invest in and develop them, and they're using their GI Bill to do that, you can hire them. 
Uh, although I would tell you that if I were an advanced practice nurse, the number one place I would go to work is the VA because there you can ex you can um, exercise all of your skills because you're under the federal rules about APN um, skills, not the state rules, which are more limiting. Um, but that's what I would think about. Invest in the people before they become APNs. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I'll add to that, I mean, 100% agree with what was said, but oftentimes too, there's um, physicians, attorneys, right, that are in these fields. And then after they separate from the military, oftentimes they don't want to do that in that specific role. They want to do something different. So there are numerous corporations that hire physicians and attorneys, but not to be physicians, attorneys, but to practice per se, but to provide that expertise to those corporations. Uh, the company I was in before, there was numerous uh, physicians in that corporation that weren't practicing uh, medicine, but they provided so much value to the organization because they had clients that they were supporting. And so I think understanding where, how, what type of organization you can add value to uh, is important. Making those connections as it was stated or way before you make that transition out is important as well. So you really understand where you can use your skill sets and, and uh, develop that network prior to separating. Great point. That's great, thank you. Uh, another question that has come in. So is there a business case for a company to create a PTO pool or similar policy to support injured veterans who need rehab time as they transition into new employment? I'll just speak from Accenture's vantage point and then open it up to the group. So we have a program uh, that's that's open up to all employees. It's called Hours That Help. And essentially, you as an individual can donate PTO hours to uh, to someone who may need them uh, for, uh, for any myriad of needs. And it remains anonymous. Uh, an individual can put their name out publicly, or you can just simply receive the request. So uh, certainly, I think that uh, that uh, those widespread programs exist, but open to other ideas or suggestions uh, in terms of uh, how we can create that support system as individuals are coming in that may need to still continue to address things that had occurred during service. Maggie, that's, I love that idea. We do that as well. Um, I also think we've learned so much from the pandemic on the value of virtual employment and um, the flexibility that uh, we now operate under in terms of what are we really nine to five anymore? No one really is anymore. People are, you know, taking meetings from cars and um, while they're dropping their kids off at school and doctors sitting in doctor's office lobbies, you know, it, it's, it is the way that we are operating now. And so having that uh, flexibility and, and being able to cap again, capitalize on that for those who um, may require some uh, hourly flexibility or even um, extra time for rehabilitation is um, is wonderful because you still have got that heart and soul of that veteran and that's really what you're hiring um, and supporting their physical needs and the, those emotional needs um, is the right thing to do. Uh, it makes for a good company and it makes for a good company culture. Yeah, I'll add to one of the things that uh, often is found out by companies, right, is when they do that make those exceptions, if you will, we'll call it exceptions for uh, for this brief conversation. But many times when they make those exceptions for veterans, they find out that it's actually more beneficial for all of their employees, because a lot of the employees need these type of exceptions. They just don't know how to ask for it, right? Mm -hmm. I always use this example, you know, when they developed the cutouts on the sidewalks, they weren't made for a veteran, right? They were made for someone who needed a wheelchair access, right? And so who uses that? All of us use that, right? And so I think uh, that's the way I used to always portray it to corporations is that oftentimes when you are creating a new way of doing something, it benefits everybody. You just haven't realized that yet. And so that's the type of mindset we have to have is being able to have that flexibility as Robin mentioned, um, because then you will retain your serve, your veterans and you retain your employees also when you allow them that flexibility. And in some companies, they have shifts, right? And so oftentimes if you can, take someone from a first shift and put them in a mid shift or something like that, that allows them to go to those appointments and they're not using PTO or using their leave. They can go to all those appointments without having to worry about it. So having training, as we talked about, right, training the managers, uh, HR, folks like that, and understanding how to really be imaginative when they're supporting veterans and in turn will support all of their employees. It's almost uh, a really a fact that 
they provide specific resources for those veterans because they're looking at it a different way. It's going to be benefit other employees across the industry. Yeah, that's yeah, a great point, James. I don't know if <clears throat> having a program for disabled veterans specifically is really a good branding opportunity because if I have a disability, whether it's visible or not, I, you don't need to be in my business that I've got to go to rehab. You know what I mean? So it's something to think about. No, that's exactly right. You know, we're trying to really get away from that narrative of a broken veteran narrative, you know, the, the, that, right? We want to look at it. It's a benefit for everybody, as I just mentioned, in, in your organization. Right? So be the veterans can use that benefit as well. Very good points. All right, I think now we are ready for the poll results. Okay, great. Hopefully everyone can, can see that. Uh, so we can see, uh, have a great turnout in terms of uh, veteran or military family members. Um, uh, we have a number of recruiters that are on the line. So hopefully this information has been beneficial to them uh, as they're thinking through creative ideas to recruit talent. And so let's take a look at the question two. So the veterans that are, are on the line, about 40% of part, uh, participants, um, there's a mix, right, in terms of um, having some access to what they need to be successful, and as well as those that feel that they don't have access to what they need to be successful. Uh, my, my hope is, is that today's conversation helped to bring to light uh, some of those additional resources I know uh, we've walked through a number of those in today's discussion. And so hopefully um, your thoughts going into today's conversation have perhaps uh, improved. And then for employers, so how well do you believe that you understand the value of hiring veterans? Uh, really strong turnout in terms of uh, very well and uh, moderately well in terms of understanding that value. And again, uh, I have no doubt that the fantastic panelists that we've had on today have uh, perhaps informed you uh, quite a bit more in terms of uh, what those tremendous value is for hiring veterans, military spouse into your organizations. And, and Maggie, I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I did not give a shout out and shameless plug for those companies that are moderately well and not very well. Uh, please reach out to me at the Veteran Staffing Network uh, of Easter Seals. And uh, let's talk about how we might be able to help you, help you get more veterans and military spouses in your organization. That's uh, vsnusa.org. I had awesome. to do it. Thank you, David. I want to open it up to the panelists. I'll just go down the line for any uh, closing comments before we end this morning's fantastic discussion. Uh, so, Bob, I'll start with you. Any, any parting words for our attendees today? No, I think the, the important thing, Maggie, is what I said in the beginning, which is uh, veterans are the future leaders of our country. Any company that didn't hire veterans would, would be short shifting, shifting themselves uh, from the labor pool, and they add tremendous diversity to organizations, and uh, that's diversity that results in better innovation. Thanks, Bob. James? Sure, I'll use the old phrase, right? It takes a village, right? And I think, you know, when we really look at uh, the value of support, it, it usually occurs at the local level. I mean, all the great work that you all do at Easter Seal is what Robin does at Hope for our Warriors, the Hope for the Warriors. I mean, all those type of organizations are the grassroots organizations that we as the federal government like to continue to partner with because of the fact that that's where a lot of trust and confidence is built for those service members when they make that transition out, military spouses. So for us, continuing to... Uh, develop partnerships and relationships with all of these organizations, corporations who want to hire veterans. That's what we're about, and that's what we want to continue to do so we can provide the best value and resources to our veterans so they make a good, informed decision when they're transitioning out. Thanks, James. Robin? Uh, I love what everyone is saying, so I'll do something different. I just, again, herald the military spouse. Um, anybody who can manage a family and move around and do all the, the multitasking and uh, stay resilient and keep a family intact. Uh, it has capabilities beyond compare. So I give shout out to the military spouses and their employment. 100%. And David. Well, uh, first I wanna start by thanking all of you. Uh, Maggie, Bob, James, Robin, um, without you folks, we couldn't have the opportunity to put um, this kind of thought leadership out there. 
I appreciate what you all do every day in your lives and in support of Easter Seals and our veteran community. Um, and uh, it's my honor to, to do this work with you. Same thank, here. thank you, yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, so thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you to the Board of Trade and to Easter Seals for putting together this important conversation. And, uh, and really uh, just capitalizing on James, your comment, I mean, today we brought together public, private, nonprofit partners, all focused on the same mission around uh, making sure that veterans find meaningful employment and providing that information outwards. And so really want to thank everyone for their time and particularly to our attendees for taking the time to listen in today. So have a fantastic Wednesday. Thank you, everyone.